Okay, here I am. Okay, and it appears that we're live on Facebook. So first, welcome everybody for participating in this conference hosted by the, sorry about that. Welcome everyone to this great conference hosted by the EU Turkey Civic Commission. I'd like to thank everyone taking the time out of their day at what is a crucial time in the region and in terms of international relations with Turkey and the Kurds to listen to this meeting and to all of our wonderful speakers who you're going to hear from today for participating in this conference. So we're here today because tomorrow, US President Joe Biden and Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan will have their first meeting of Joe Biden's presidency. And this comes at a time when Turkey's domestic authoritarianism and foreign military invasions are wreaking havoc across the region. Turkey invades and occupies territory currently in Syria and Iraq in predominantly Kurdish regions, also home to other vulnerable minority communities as well. They have forced ethnic and religious minority communities from their homes. They have supported extremist militias, credibly accused by the United Nations of war crimes. They have emptied villages, destroyed agricultural land, and otherwise committed various atrocities against the peoples of the region. Domestically, Turkey is cracking down on the only political opposition that it has left. A recent case was filed to close the pro-Kurdish, pro-peace, and pro-democracy People's Democratic Party, the HDP, and to ban 500 of its members from participating in politics. The HDP is the only party to call for decentralization, democracy, minority rights, women's rights, and particularly a peaceful solution to the Kurdish question. And peaceful relations with his neighbors is truly the only real opposition that Turkey has left. And this closure is one of many recent signs we've seen of heightening authoritarianism under Turkey's government. Now to highlight all of this and to show how they come together with US-Turkey relations and broader issues of international law and stability in the region, we're going to talk about a place called Mahmur Refugee Camp. Many of you may not have heard of it, but the story of Mahmoor and the thousands of men, women, and children who live there despite all odds is a story that is a microcosm of the broader issues of the conflict between the Turkish state and the Kurdish people across the region. Mahmoor camp was founded in the 1990s by Kurdish refugees fleeing a systematic campaign of village demolitions carried out by Turkish security forces in which nearly 4,000 villages were destroyed and about 3 million people were displaced during this time, the Turkish military and other security forces also carried out atrocities against civilians who remained in those areas, including enforced disappearances, political assassinations, arbitrary detentions, torture, the destruction and appropriation of property, and many more. And so the people who fled this destruction of their homes and these unlivable conditions in these villages went to Iraq, they crossed the border, and were ultimately, after pressure forced them to move from a camp closer to the Iraqi-Turkish border, moved into an area in Mahmoor that was, at the time, almost completely inhospitable to human life. Yet they survived, and the people of Mahmoor, over the past 30 years, have built a refugee camp that has a democratic elected government, where children study in Kurdish, their native language, and where people have built the institutions that they need to live despite pressure on all sides. And there is very real pressure because the international community has failed its obligations to these refugees. Instead of supporting them and helping make sure that Turkey takes steps to allow them to be compensated for what state violence did to them and allow them to return to their homes, Turkey has enlisted its allies from the United States and the UN to local forces in Iraq and the Kurdistan region to target these refugees. They've tried to close the camp many times. They've tried to demand that these people go elsewhere, even though there's nowhere else for them to go. 
And there's been very little pushback against this. In fact, documents show that the US and the KRG and the government of Iraq have historically supported Turkey in this. Just last week, Turkey bombed Mahmoud refugee camp just outside of a children's playground in the middle of the day in a blatant war crime targeting this UN recognized protected area. So this isn't new. And the international community and the institutions that are supposed to protect refugees from the events of this week, going back to Turkish efforts to attack, target, and even close down the camp over the past 20, 25, 30 years that they've been there, is a long-standing pattern. And it goes to show how Turkey's war on its Kurdish population and on Kurdish civilians across the region causes real threats to international norms, to democratic principles, and to the basic ideas about human rights that the international rules-based order has been based on. So we're going to talk in this meeting a little bit more about that history, the impact of that conflict, and about what it would take and what the United States and other countries could do to change their, their relations with Turkey, to push to create conditions where the people of Mahmoud would no longer be subjected to these abuses. Because the reality is the situation in Turkey right now is very much like it was when these refugees left. There is still forced displacement of Kurds. There is still cultural and linguistic repression. There are still atrocities carried out against civilians. The politicians who call for justice for these crimes are imprisoned. The journalists who write about them and bring them to the attention of the media are too. These people still have a well-founded fear of persecution were they to return because the government in Turkey today is still a far-right alliance of nationalists and Islamists who have the persecution of Kurds and a war on the Kurdish people across the region at the center of their agenda. So there needs to be, in order to align policy in the region with human rights, with democracy, and with the basic principles of international law, a completely new approach to how foreign countries deal with the Kurdish question and we're going to talk about that in terms of the situation in Mahmoud and beyond today. So with that, I'd like to bring up our first speaker, David Phillips, the Director of Peacebuilding and Human Rights and the Institute for the Study of Human Rights at Columbia University. Thank you for being here with us today, David. Megan, thanks very much. And thanks to the commission for inviting me today. Megan, I wanna compliment your outstanding work on this topic. Uh, you've really made a difference, and it's a pleasure to cooperate with you. A few years ago, I published a book which was entitled An Uncertain Ally. In between finishing the book and its publication, I thought to retitle it, not an uncertain ally, but an unreliable ally. Uh, in addition to that, Turkey has evolved from becoming an unreliable ally to a strategic adversary. Excuse me a second. Sorry about that. We had some people come by and that was my dog reacting to the visitors. But let me just re restate. My book was titled An Uncertain Ally. It should have been called An Unreliable Ally. And since then, Turkey has evolved from being unreliable to being a strategic adversary. The, the timing of this meeting today comes at a critical moment because tomorrow in Brussels, President Joe Biden and Tayyip Erdogan will meet. We often hear excuses from Turkey for their behavior saying we're a NATO ally and we deserve special consideration. Well, as I've said before, and I'll restate today, uh, NATO is more than a security alliance. It's a coalition of countries with shared values. And Turkey, because it is Islamist, anti-American, and hostile to security co coordination, wouldn't even be considered for NATO membership if it was invited to join the alliance today. I'm sure that President Biden and, and President Erdogan are going to have a, an adult conversation. And it's not going to be an easy discussion. Um, Biden will in all likelihood raise concerns about Turkey's abysmal human rights record and its aggressive behavior in the region. Uh, Turkey's deployment of its armed forces and jihadi mercenaries to Syria, Libya, and Nagorno-Karabakh will be a high priority. 
as should be its disregard for Iraq's territorial integrity and its attacks on the Mahmur camp. Turkey targets Kurds and Christians in Iraqi Kurdistan, violating territorial integrity and sowing the seeds of regional conflagration. As we know, this occurs in some historical context. Turkey's security state has targeted the PKK since the 1980s, resulting in the deaths of more than 40,000 people. Turkish warplanes and armed Bayraktar drones regularly bomb PKK bases in the Kandil Mountains of northern Iraq. Now, the Turkish Grand National Assembly has authorized hot pursuit operations aimed at rooting out PKK fighters and destroying their bases across the border. These cross-border operations occur regularly, especially in the spring and summer. Biden should remind Erdogan that there is no military solution to the conflict with the PKK. He should emphasize that the PKK is not a separatist organization. They demand greater political and cultural rights within Turkey. In fact, Kurds in Turkey support Turkey's EU membership, which requires greater minority rights protection and promotion through the rule of law. Rather than reconciliation, however, uh, Erdogan maintains pressure on Kurds in Turkey, Iraq, and Syria. The government recently initiated a court case, as Megan said in her introduction, to close the pro-Kurdish People's Democratic Party. Prominent HDP politicians, such as co-chairs Selahattin Demirtas and Figen Yüksedag, have been jailed for allegedly supporting a terrorist organization. Scores of democratically elected Kurdish mayors have been replaced with pro-government mm -hmm. trustees. Biden should seek the release of Demirtas and Yüksedag, as well as other political prisoners. The U.S. should support international facilitation to advance the dialogue with the PKK, based on an understanding that mediation and dialogue is the best way to resolve the Kurdish question. Turkey's recent assault on the Kurdistan region of Iraq has destroyed 50 villages and dislocated thousands. This is on top of the many, many hundreds or thousands of villages previously destroyed and hundreds of thousands or millions of people who have been displaced. Turkey ignores the objections of the government of Iraq and the Kurdistan regional government of Iraq. It established in establishing 41 military bases and outposts on Iraqi territory under the pretext of fighting the PKK. Turkish warplanes just recently as last week have bombed the UN's Mahmur refugee camp, which is home to about 13,000 Kurds who fled Turkey to find sanctuary in Iraqi Kurdistan. On June 2nd, Erdogan threatened, if the United Nations doesn't clear it as a member of the UN, we will cleanse Mahmur ourselves. Beyond Mahmur, Turkish F-16s and, and armed drones attack civilians in the Sinjar region, uh, targeting Yazidis who are still struggling to recover from the ISIS genocide, as well as Christian communities in the Nineveh plains, which have also been attacked. So you'll hear a lot more about these occurrences over the course of today's conference. You know, as the leadoff speaker, I'm going to try to focus the remainder of my time on what the U.S. can do about it. Uh, beyond words and rhetoric, it's important that we take specific steps to discourage Turkey's aggression and to make Turkey know that it will pay a significant price if it ignores uh, the international order. Uh, Biden should make clear that the U.S. will oppose violations of Iraq's territorial integrity by any frontline state, including Turkey. Beyond rhetoric, the U.S. should enforce a no-fly zone in the skies above Iraqi Kurdistan of the 36th parallel and north if Turkey continues bombing. Biden should warn Erdogan to stop supporting proxies such as Sunni Turkmen militias, in Kirkuk province and Sunni Arab militias and forces in Nineveh, as well as jihadist mercenaries with al-Nusra and al-Qaeda affiliated groups. Uh, these mercenaries are responsible for war crimes, 
mutilating bodies and beheading civilians. To uphold the international rules-based order, the US has powerful sanctions at its disposal for individuals who violate human rights, including Turkish officials who support terrorism. Uh, Biden should make very clear that those sanctions could be enacted targeting uh, not only jihadi mercenaries, but Turkish officials who support them and are responsible for coordinating their activity. Adopted in 2012, the Global Magnitsky Human Rights Accountability Act, GEMA, or authorizes the president to impose economic sanctions and deny entry into the United States to anyone identified as engaging in human rights abuses or corruption. If Turkey's National Intelligence Agency is responsible for coordinating jihadi crimes in Syria and in Northern Iraq, then its director, Hakan Fidan, should be barred from travel to the United States. And we should discuss with Interpol other measures that could be brought to bear against him and his representatives. Uh, in 2018, a Congress upgraded GMA, allowing the U.S. to sanction government officials implicated in abuses anywhere in the world. Legislation also applies to individuals involved in significant corruption, such as the misappropriation of public funds and interfering with public processes, including using their power for their own benefit and to enrich themselves and their family members. Certainly Erdogan qualifies as someone who could be targeted under uh, global Magnitsky because he has been involved yeah, in the misuse of public funds, uh, interference with an independent media, uh, and using state resources to control and to enrich himself. Uh, Erdogan has systematically manipulated the media to disseminate pro-government disinformation. So if you look at a checklist of criteria for the Global Magnitsky Act, senior, US, senior Turkish officials going all the way to the top could be eligible for sanctions if the US wants to proceed. Biden administration has already demonstrated its willingness to use strong rhetoric. Biden's statement on April 24th, Armenian Genocide Remembrance Day, recognized the Armenian Genocide sanctions may also be envisioned. The U.S. has also proven its willingness to take specific steps. It has already imposed sanctions on Turkey under CATSA, countering American adversaries through Sanctions Act, or Turkey's purchase of S-400 missiles from Russia. Biden should warn Erdogan that sanctions may be imposed if he continues his aggression in the region. Biden is at his core an Atlanticist who strongly believes that the transatlantic sanctions are more effective than any that the US can do alone. In coordination with European and NATO allies, the US should ratchet up sanctions on Turkish institutions and individuals who commit crimes. We know from experience dealing with Turkey that it only responds under duress and when there's a considerable price to pay. Now, in the spirit of transatlantic cooperation, I'd like to submit to the conference today a proposal that members of the US Congress and members of the US of the European Parliament establish a joint sanctions committee to consider what sanctions have been imposed, to monitor their effectiveness, uh, and to assess what comes next. The best way to get Turkey to change its aggressive behavior in the region is to require it to pay a considerable price. Transatlantic cooperation between the US and European institutions is the best way to coordinate not only a message, but uh, a clear signal uh, that the international community will not tolerate Turkey's war crimes. Uh, in Northern Iraq, in other countries where Turkey has deployed special forces, and also within Turkey itself, uh, which has become a giant gulag with Tur Kurds, the primary victim of Erdogan's aggressive and anti-democratic policies. So I wanted to give a brief summary of the situation uh, to identify instruments 
at the disposal of the U.S. government that it can use to ratchet up the pressure on Turkey and to recommend a specific measure uh, to implement those sanctions in coordination uh, between the U.S. and European institutions. Only through coordinated international action will Turkey pay a significant price, which could compel it to change its behavior. So I appreciate the opportunity today to join the conference. Thank you for giving me a platform to express my views. And I look forward to continued cooperation uh, with all of you as we raise awareness, spotlight Turkey's actions, and promote policies that can serve as sanctuary for Kurds in Syria and in Iraqi Kurdistan. But thank you all very much and best wishes for a successful conference today. Thank you so much, David. Uh, we really appreciate that insight and those very concrete policy recommendations. And what I'll add is that uh, in terms of some of the recommendations made, Biden himself has supported these exact things during his past as a senator. Because in the 104th Congress, uh, Senate Resolution Number 91, he called Turkey's intervention against Kurds in northern Iraq illegal. And in Senate Bill 578, the Turkish Human Rights Compliance Act, also in the 104th Congress, he called on Turkey to recognize the civil, cultural, and human rights of its Kurdish citizens, cease its military operations against Kurdish civilians, and take demonstrable steps towards a peaceful resolution of the Kurdish issue. So I agree, these are not only common sense steps for a, pro a policy based on peace, democracy, and human rights, but there are even things that our current president in his previous political career as a senator has supported before. So thank you for those recommendations and for your work on this issue. Our next speaker will be uh, Nadine Mayenza, who is a member of the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom. She's spent considerable time in the autonomous administration of North and East Syria, directly meeting with communities affected by Turkey's expansionist policies, and um, she will have her presentation now for us to hear. Nadine. Thanks so much, Megan. And I'd like to thank the EU-Turkey Civil Commission for including me in this critical discussion on U.S.-Turkey relations, um, especially in the context of human rights and international law with Turkey's recent targeting, the Makmur refugee camp. As Megan had said, I've had the privilege of spending um, over seven weeks on the ground in Northeast Syria and in the Kurdistan region of Iraq in the past seven months, most recently in April. And while I serve as a commissioner on the US Commission on International Religious Freedom, these trips have been in my own capacity with um, Freedom Research Foundation and not as a government official. Fortunately, the information I gather can still be used to inform the commission, just like we depend on many of these panelists and others for information as well. So today I'll be speaking in my own capacity since much of what I share is out of USERF's very specific mandate that only covers religious freedom. I will refer to USERF's recommendations since they are relevant for today's conversation. The one thing I've learned being on the ground in these areas is the importance of governance. It is the most underrated and misunderstood asset in the Middle East. Yet governance is the key to increasing human rights conditions and governance is also the only way to end forever wars. I'd like to start by reviewing Tuesday's U.S. Senate Foreign Relations Committee hearing, where Secretary of State Anthony Blinken spent almost three hours testifying. At the very end, the chairman of the committee, Senator Bob Menendez, asked about Turkey, and he mentioned journalists and lawyers in jail, Turkey threatening Cyprus, Greece, aggression against Armenia through Azerbaijan, Turkey playing a nefarious role in Libya, and then he asked, what are we doing to counter Erdogan? Blinken said he shared those concerns, he mentions the, seven, I mean, the S-400s, and then he says that Turkey, quote, is not acting as a NATO ally it should be, end quote. He assured um, Senator Menendez that President Biden will raise these issues with Erdogan. Senator Blinken continued to say, I will say we also have an interest in trying to keep Turkey anchored to the West and aligned on some other very critical issues. We do have important and overlapping interests in various ways in Syria when it comes to counterterrorism in Afghanistan dealing with Russia and Iran's malign influence, but we also have to confront these differences that you rightly spotlight. The first thing that struck me about this conversation was the suggestion that somehow Turkey assists the US in countering terrorism in Syria. Brad McGurk himself said in a Washington Post op-ed that most of the nearly 40,000 foreign fighters that came to Syria came through Turkey. 
McGurk also said in a foreign policy article he wrote in 2019 that, quote, Turkey refused coalition requests to close border crossings in towns that had become logistical hubs for ISIS, such as Tel Abiyad, even after US diplomats had told the Turks that if they did not control their border, defeating ISIS would be impossible. I was also deeply disappointed that Turkey's actions in Northeast Syria and Kurdistan region of Iraq were not mentioned. Turkey is violating the sovereignty of both countries, which violates international law and threatens their stability. And in Northeast Syria, those actions also include what is likely war crimes, according to the State Department's own just released International Religious Freedom Report, where they document killings, rape, kidnapping, forced conversions, and more. Those targeted, mostly Yazidis, Kurds, Christians, and especially women from these communities. So I have come um, to understand an important truth that helps explain some of this disconnect. The Department of State is all about diplomacy, diplomacy with nation states, building alliances and managing complicated relationships. So simplistically, the State Department seems to prioritize keeping nation states allies happy. There are plenty of other programs and entire departments dedicated to human rights and religious freedom, but they all take a back seat to this priority. So what Turkey is doing right now in Iraq and Syria against religious and ethnic minorities and local autonomous governments just does not rise to the level of lesser offenses against nation states. So yes, Turkey violating Cy Cyprus's economic zone gets attention during a Senate foreign relations hearing, but Turkey bombing the Makmur refugee camp killing Kurdish civ civilians does not, even after the US ambassador to the UN, Linda Thomas-Greenfield warned them not to do so. Turkey and its Islamist militias committing horrific atrocities against minority communities in Afrin, Sarakani, and other places that Turkey has invaded and occupied in Northeast Syria just does not get the same attention as lesser economic offenses against a nation state. Well, I have no doubt that there are many people in the State Department who are deeply worried about these crimes, perhaps even Secretary Blinken himself. The system is simply not designed to rank these crimes as the same as in importance. And I'm not suggesting we accept that, but rather acknowledge the reality and the fact that it needs to be addressed. USERF was created as an independent bipartisan government agency 23 years ago because of this disconnect. Just this week, former Congressman Frank Wolf, who helped put the legislation together that formed USERF, reminded us that we were created to work outside the normal government framework. He urged us to continue to be truth tellers, no matter how hard it was. And in the past, he's also urged us to be disruptors. USERF's recommendations to the US government are important because they often disrupt the normal process. They go against the US government's inclination to look away and ignore anything that complicates their relationships with other countries. Yet, there are so many reasons we must speak the truth. So let's lay out some important truths we can all agree upon regarding Iraq and Syria. Currently, the only real stability in Iraq is in the Kurdistan region. Yet Turkey is threatening that right now with its constant incursions and airstrikes. The only real stability in Syria is in the Northeast. Yet Turkey is threatening that right now with its incursions, occupation, and shelling in violation of the ceasefire agreement with the US. Erdogan is continuing to do this because he can. He's getting very little resistance. In Iraq, the Kurdistan regional government was put in a very difficult situation in 2014 as it accepted over 2 million people fleeing ISIS. They were welcomed regardless of their religion or ethnicity. Even now, the KRG continues to house over 780,000 IDPs from Iraq and 260,000 Syrian refugees at a cost of over $1 billion a year. While I share in current concerns of their clampdown on journalists, opposition, and their close relationship with Turkey, it is important that we understand these realities as well. USERP has consistently commended them for their positive religious freedom conditions. There are cranes and new construction everywhere as they can't keep up with the demand for housing as the affluent from all over Iraq are looking to relocate to the Kurdistan region. Yet the Iraqi government continues to be in arrears for the money rightfully budgeted for Erbil. The US should press Baghdad to meet their financial obligations. This has put the KRG in a precarious economic situation and that puts them further at the mercy and influence of Turkey. Turkey's operations under the cover of countering the PKK have targeted civilians with at least 54 having been killed in just the past six years, and I understand even more today, according to the International Crisis Group. Many more have been wounded or have permanently lost their homes and livelihood without any compensation. Even, um, as I said, this weekend, we know that Turkey has done several airstrikes, including another one at the Mekmar refugee camp. The Turkish interior minister recently said of Iraq, quote, just as in Syria, we will establish a base here and monitor the region, end quote. Given the state of the current Turkish occupation in Syria, this is very disturbing. 
USURF has condemned airstrikes that seem to target Yazidis, Assyrians, and other minority community. USURF has also warned against an invasion into Sinjar. These airstrikes on the Makmar refugee camp are especially troubling, considering they ignored a US government warning. Will there be any consequences for their actions? In Syria, the Autonomous Administration of North and East Syria has built a remarkable democracy that has embedded principles of inclusivity in every level of government. It's almost unbelievable that just less than four years ago, this was the headquarters of the ISIS Caliphate, and it now has the best human rights, gender equality, and religious freedom conditions in the region. This multi-ethnic, multi-religious government is now actually majority Arab, with the same positive conditions seen in those areas as well. In order to preserve Northeast Syria as a refuge for religious minorities, USURF has recommended that the US government expand engagement with the Autonomous Administration, lift sanctions from the area that they govern, and give them political recognition as a local, legitimate government. The US should also demand their inclusion in all discussions for a political solution per UN Resolution 2254. As you all know, since 2018, Turkey has invaded three times under the cover of fighting the PKK, causing hundreds of deaths, thousands of injuries, and over 200,000 in their homes. They even have weaponized water against the people of Northeast Syria. I was able to see for myself that how they've decreased the water level on the Euphrates River coming into Syria, violating a previous agreement in international law. In the areas they have invaded and now govern in Afrin, Tel Abiyad, and Sarakani, we see horrific conditions that are more like the ISIS Caliphate than the free areas they were under the autonomous administration. For that reason, USURF has recommended that the US government press Turkey to provide a timeline for its withdrawal from all territory that it occupies in Northeast Syria. The US government should also make it clear that Turkey must order all armed factions under its control or influence to seize all activities that negatively impact minority communities. It could be easy to misunderstand my support for the autonomous administration as being unconditional, but that simply is not true. I support them because of their conditions and encourage the US government to audit the autonomous administration and see these conditions for themselves. As in every young government, they have their shortcomings and would benefit from the US and international support and advice. Now, one of the main four main goals decided at the G7 Seven summit this week was to quote, build back better by championing shared values, including democracy and human rights, end quote. President Biden and Secretary Blinken have both stressed that human rights need to be the center of US foreign policy. In looking at US USERF's annual report on international religious freedom that was released in April, covering the worst violators of religious freedom in the world, almost every country USERF covers in the Middle East was trending negatively in 2021. The outlier areas, Northeast Syria and Iraqi Kurdistan. President Biden has often spoke of ending forever wars. The only way to stop a forever war is governance. In Northeast Syria, the autonomous administration is how we hold the ground we won, so we don't have to come back and fight for it again. In the Kurdistan region of Iraq, ISIS was never able to get a foothold because of the KRG's governance. Yet Turkey is threatening this governance in both countries, and we've already seen ISIS reemerge because of Turkey's actions. As President Biden meets with President Erdogan this week, the natural inclination will be to prioritize NATO countries and nation states in general. Instead, I hope Biden makes it clear to Erdogan that these autonomous governments have U.S. support and are an important part of U.S. foreign policy to protect human rights and the stability of both Iraq and Syria, and that any further incursions or military action in either will be met with strong U.S. actions. Thank you. I look forward to a continued conversation. Thank you, Nadine, for joining and for your insights and research. We greatly appreciate it, and we appreciate your bringing in that religious freedom perspective as well. Um, our next speaker is going to be uh, Kerianne Westheim, the chairwoman of the EU-Turkey Civic Commission and a professor of educational sciences at the University of Bergen in Norway. She has researched um, knowledge construction and multiculturalism within political movements and education in areas of war and conflict and has written several publications on movement. So over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Megan. I have the pleasure of talking uh, 50 minutes about Mahmo, a Kurdish refugee camp, uh, camp, as you mentioned, which is close to my heart, both academically and personally. I will focus on the younger generation of Mahmoud, no students of higher education who has grown up in Mahmoud. Their voices represent the tomorrow of the Kurdish struggle. And at the end, I will say uh, why I see Mahmoud as a litmus test 
why it is important. Imagine a desert with deadly scorpions and snakes crawling around, burning sun and ice cold nights. This reality met the Kurdish refugees from North Kurdistan when Saddam Hussein in the early 1990s led them to what can only be described as a, as a graveyard. Uh, they fled across the border after the Turkish army adopted uh, the policy of so-called direct mass uh, extermination. What was their crime? Well, simply refusing becoming village guards, which would mean betraying the PKK, uh, whom they regarded as their legitimate protection. Now, not the PKK, but Turkey's his historic policy of extermination of the Kurds is to blame for the creation of this camp. The story does not end there. Turkey continues its bloody attacks on, on, uh, on the Kurds and on the camp. In 2014, and also later, they were attacked by ISIS backed by Turkey. And at the beginning of this month, as you said, uh, Erdogan carried out his announced airstrike, resulting in the death of three people. In this interview, which has been cited many times, Erdogan said that if the United Nations did not clean it up, not clean the camp up, he would do it as a UN, a UN member. The question is how the UN can tolerate being reprimanded and why it accepts that Turkey in the next direct a deadly attack on a refugee camp, they themselves claim to assist, all, all by it uh, cosmetically. The UN High Commissioner for Refugees makes a huge number of having registered the Mahmo refugees, providing them with identity cards, which make it easier for them to work and travel outside the camp, and for young people to study or to travel abroad to study. P uh, it looks great on paper, but seems far from the reality Mahmo uh, experience. People are stuck in the camp and can work and stay outside camp only to a limited degree. Students who manage to get enrolled at the universities outside the camp receive no help, whether from the Kurdistan regional government or the High Commissioner for Refugees. They complete only by huge efforts and with the help of fellow, fellow refugee students. When students um, were enrolled in university, they translate every book from Arabic or Sohani into Comanche. The next student inherits the translated book. There is no spare time, no possibility to live what we usually associate with a student's life. I visited Mahmoud to do field research in 2006 to 2010 and, and 15 to talk to students about schooling, education, and prospects for the future. What I found was that they contribute, they participate, and support each other and the community in every possible way. This is how they cope and sometimes succeed. They are ambitious on behalf of the people and their leader, Abdel Öcalan. They work extremely hard to get a higher education. The journalist Amberin Saman states in Al Monito, 2nd June 2021, after Turkey's drone attack, that children are indoctrinated with PKK ideology at schools in Mahmur. This is not true. The reality of the young generation in Mahmoud, their families' experiences of oppression, displacement, war, and violence go far beyond our imagination. The struggle for survival applies to both the parent generation and the children. When someone sees indoctrination or brainwashing, I met uh, children and youth who were eager to educate themselves and seek meaning in an apparently meaningless uh, uh, situation. Despite all the horror the refugees face in the past and the hardship 
and threats they experience in the present, they still refuse to bow for the Turkish state. Instead, they have built a new society, organized neighborhood assemblies and workers' corporations. Deprived of previous education, building schools became a priority. One male student described how children and youth carried stones to build the first school uh, um, until their hands bled. 12,000 individuals joined hands and started to build a viable uh, society with an impenetrable collective will fueled by political visions. It was a mobilization of collective individuals who accepted hunger and hardship, but claimed freedom. Unique institutions grew up in Mahmoud, funded on the ideas of democratic autonomy, self-government structures, and direct bottom-up de democracy. Slowly, a new normal was created in the camp. Mahmo has become a green village with a range of various small businesses, associations and organizations. Democratic autonomy is no longer a model or a project. It is a shining example of lived democracy, a model that Rojava has developed further. As AFN News puts it, Mahmo is the mother of the democratic autonomy model put in practice. A new generation has grown up in this strategically forgotten camp, which during the years, as mentioned above, has received a minimum of support from international NGOs and organizations like UNICEF. The stories of the Mahmoud students, bring, bring, the, the students brings into the classroom often reflect the ethos and spirit of the community community's collective memory. The parents' sufferings have become the children's power, with Kurdish language as, as the strongest uh, tool. By enrolling in school and later higher education, they resemble the oppression imposed on them, as one student puts it. Our parents did not have the opportunity to get an education. Most of them cannot even write their names. All this, uh, all this changed when we came to Mahmoud. Today, my mother goes to school and learn in her own language. I want to educate myself to value my parents' efforts to provide me an education in Kurdish. In Mahmoud, education is a transformative political enterprise that has nothing to do with indoctrination, as someone claimed. Hundreds of students attend secondary school. If they get good grades, they enroll in certain university. But instead of using the education, education to leave the camp, get a good job and earn money, most of these students uh, want to use their knowledge to help and support the community in Mahmoud. Becoming aware of one's oppressed uh, history, democratic rights, better, uh, uh, being better equipped to participate in democratic life and with the ability to read political situations can be termed political literacy. Education and political literacy are essential elements in the upbringing of the children in Mahmoud and crucial to break the silence and make people aware of their condition and democratic, democratic rights. In, in, again, this is transformative democratic education, not brainwashing. The motivation, level of reflect, reflection and courage the students show give hopes for the future and how we uh, envision a lived democratic society. I asked the female students of 18 if she and her friends wanted to leave the camp, if they envied Western youth for having more possibilities, more freedom, more money, more fun, she answered, either we live together or we stay here until our leader is free and as long as the occupation of Kurdistan persists. We, we envy no one. We will return to our homes in freedom and take with us the best for Mahmoud. This generation of Kurds cannot be crushed by Aragon. They have 
a conviction, a fighting spirit, and democratic basic view that cannot be broken down, neither through Turkish propaganda nor with weapons. Although Erdogan's intention is to exterminate the Kurds under the pretext of ending the PKK once and for all, he has also suffered many defeats and class, uh, clashes with the guerrilla and probably will face it again. It is incomprehensible that neither the EU, the UN or NATO are reacting to Turkey's bloody Kurdish campaign in Mahmoud. Rojava, northeast Syria, northern North Kurdistan are now in the Kurdistan region Iraq. The UN reacted strongly to Israel's bombing of Gaza, calling it a war crime. Why are they unable to look at Turkey's at atrocities in the same way? Why do NATO allow a member to conduct acts of war within another sovereign state? Tomorrow, the NATO meeting in Brussels uh, will take place with Biden and, and his counterpart Erdogan. An important issue at the meeting is, is the climate crisis, which will be important for NATO in the future because it will affect military planning, choice of weapons and strategy. The current Kurdish military attacks on, North, on South Kurdistan are not only a human catastrophe, but also lead to massive ecological disaster. Turkish aim is to occupy the Kurdish territory and weaken Kurdish, Kurdish resistance, like the PKK. The general goal of this occupation campaign are assimilation, demographic change, ethnic cleansing, war crimes, and the destruction of Kurdistan's environment. It has caused great harm to the forests and wildlife in South Kurdistan region. The military burned, poisoned, and destroyed large, valuable mountain and nature areas, and expelled the population in Kurdish inhabited areas of northern Iraq. But this will probably not be a topic at the NATO's agenda. So, Finally, to conclude, why is Mahmoud a threat to Turkey? Why is it a litmus test? Why can it be seen as a litmus test? It is not the refugee camp itself. It is not because the PKK is said to be res uh, resting and healing their wounds in, the camp, wounds in the camp. It is the very mindset Erdogan fear. The democratic self-governing principle that makes the Kurds independent and autonomous, that makes women consciously acting economic and political uh, individuals on an equal footing with and independent of the man. Mahmoud has become the crown jewel, the symbol of the Kurds' vision of a society based on ecology, gender equality, and the inclusion of minorities and peoples of all kinds. The model has been introduced and realized in Mahmoud in Rojava, northeast Syria. There are constant attempts in North Kurdistan. Altogether, the introduction of democratic autonomy strengthened Kurdish independence and thereby pose a great threat to Turkey's occupational interest and desires for a pan-Ottoman Islamist expansion. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much for your incredible insight into the lives of the people living in Mahmoor and into their incredible resistance over nearly 30 years of attacks from all sides and violations of their basic rights. I think it's incredibly important that we remember that at the end of the day, we're talking about the basic right of human beings to live on their land, with their culture, with their language, and with their freedom. And when we look at these basic principles, we see that these are not controversial. There is an international right to resistance and self-determination in international law, you know, established in United Nations documents. There is an international right for children to be educated in their language. There is an international right for women to be free and empowered. So when we're looking at the case of Mahmoor and how it's been targeted on all sides by a variety of actors, including Turkey, the United States, the KRG, and the government of Iraq, we're looking at an international attack on the most basic freedoms that belong to all human beings. 
So I greatly appreciate that very powerful explanation of exactly what these people have been fighting for and what they're building under such harsh circumstances. And on that note, we'll now be listening to a voice directly from Mukmore. Um, I'm very glad that we're going to be able to do this as Western media systemically silences Kurdish voices in areas that Turkey has invaded and occupied and often within Turkey itself. We've seen a lot of incredibly biased Western mainstream media coverage that uncritically quotes Turkish statements. And so this is a necessary corrective to that. So I'd like to invite uh, Bewar Unber from the uh, Diplomacy uh, Committee in Mahmoud Camp as a local resident on the ground, and someone working in foreign relations, he'll be able to tell the story of this oppressed population demanding its basic rights and what they've suffered to do so. Over to you, thank you. Hello, Riz. Uh, how are you all? I, I hope you're all fine. Uh, My name is Bewar uh, Unver. A member of a uh, diplomacy community of uh, in Mahmoud camp. I'm very happy and I would like to thank you so much for this opportunity that you gave me to explain the situation in Mahmoud. And I, I can also, I would like to thank uh, all the efforts that have been made to make uh, such as meeting to explain the situation and the, the urgent uh, situation that happens right now in, in Mahmoud. So because of that, uh, in the name of 12,000 people living in Mahmoud, I would like in their names, I would like to thank you all and uh, greetings for you. Jordan, you work the speaker Jima on his mom, Irishaki, Hawaii, the Boshuri Kurson in Sachibu, the way Rishid in Sun and Civil, Jordan Buna Kurboni, and the way Rio Vibanami, Sir Sahijim or what you are. As you mentioned, and I, I did as well, uh, like uh, a week ago, uh, and also today. An airstrike happened in, in, in uh, the north of, of Iraq that killed four civilians. I would like to pay my condolences to, to their families. It, it happens on daily basis in Mahmur uh, camp. I was very glad to hear all the information that you already have on, on, on the Mahmoud camp, which made me very uh, enthusiastic to talk about the situation. I would like to talk about uh, the situation right now and some uh, more information about the, the current situation that ha is happening in Mahmoud camp right now. In 1990, the Turkish state launched a genocidal policy against the residents of northern uh, Kurdistan, which is uh, southern of Turkey. Because they were just Kurds, they lived by their own culture language and values. The Turkish government or army told them that you either be become village guards and state spies, otherwise you will die. This we did not have rights as people and as uh, as a nation. Because 
امجی نچار بود پنابر بود جگرش در وی پنابری تو شانس اگنش بومد نمان They were imposing a life of shame on us In these brutal attacks nearly 4,000 villages were burned burned to ground and thousands were killed and dis- 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 disappeared As a result of these horrific attacks we could only escape because we had no other chance at life the sala hazar nasad nu tu charan de le zafo kam pa behire bersiri nishta jehbun evi demi netemi yegui bu fermi mawaka panaberin siyasi stati panaberin siyasi qabul kir waka siwanji de ber jiana mede de ber al kariya mede pa ber firzdi devi demi de nek ari kariya mruviji pekani للفير رقم سيوانا نتيم يقول رقم بناوى سينوري دولة العراق الدجي دولة الترك ببالا فران قام فما بردومان كير دفي قام في دجي إنساني ما هادن قطع In 1994 in Bersivere the Bersivere camp was established in Zakho The United Nations formally accepted the camp as refugees in a political situation taking the responsibility for our lives and our security. Some humanitarian aid was provided here. Although we were under the protection of the United Nations and within the borders of the state of Iraq, Turkey bombed our camp with airplanes. Our people have been massacred in that time. Uh, ال نفتشا مخموری اگریدای موسیلی که 9 کیلومتر دور موسیلی و 6 کیلومتر دور باجار هولیره لقزا مخموری به جهبون. In in May uh, 1998, with the efforts of the United Nations and with the approval of the Republic of Iraq, we settled in the Mahmur district of Mosul, about which is about 90 kilometers away from Mosul. and 60 kilometers away from the city of Erbil, Hawler, in Mahmoud. Wakil Shini, Zedi Dazda Hazar Kesin, Prani Jwe Shini Jinu Zarukin, Jwe Shini Char Hazar Tani Kandakam, Angu Jinni Ve Shini Kampama, Temenu Ve Khari Hajda Salimu. This camp has a population of more than 12,000 people, mostly women and children. Uh, and 4,000 students, which means that more than half of these of the po- uh, population is under the age of 18. <laughs> پیش خستن پروژه آبوری آریکاری مادی و معنویش بود کسین سقت کسین نکارم با خودام بکن کسین که نخوشین طایبت هی درمانی وان پیدا کرن جاردن نخوشخانه نواق وارگی ده آلی دکتر آلی تکنیکی ده آلی درمان ده آریکاری ده کرن جبو قادر پروردی جی جبو خواندوان هم جی آریکاری تختاسی ده کرن جاردش بو جنو زاروکان هنه پروژه پیش دخستن یعنی این پروژه نه حتی سال ده هزار و شازده انجی برشکی پیگ ده هاش The United Nations and the state of Iraq uh, helped their and uh, provided their humanitarian assistance till that time and the Iraqi government and the United Nations established their headquarters, their offices inside the camp and developed important administrative projects as the constructions of uh, buildings such as schools, hospitals, mosques, etc. Developing also uh, economical projects, providing material and moral assistance to the dis- disabled and the homeless, and providing medicines to the serious and chronic ill people. The hospital was, was staffed with doctors, pharmacists, and technicians who provided all the, the necessary uh, medical treatments to the to the people, so the United Nations continued the support, continued to support all these important projects until 2016. 
ji ber artêşa Iraqê û pêşmerge berka xwe parastî nerabûn û me hêlan di çendera Daişê de di vê demê de girdayên peyekê çawa çûn Şengalê Kerkûkê parastin bi heman awayî me jî di vê demê de parastin di êrişên terorîsma Daişê de hejmarekî hemwelatiyê me jiyana xwe ji dest dan û hejmarek jî birîndar bûn heya roja îro jî rojane di bin armanca êrişên Daişê In 2014, uh, terrorist attacks were carried out by the Islamic State against us with the aim of killing us, just like Sinjar, what happened in Sinjar. Our camp was besieged by ISIS and surrounded by it. And unfortunately, because of the Iraqi army forces and the Peshmerga, the local uh, army of, of uh, Kurdistan region did not do their duty towards the camp and left their positions. The PKK fighters and guerrillas, uh, how they went to Sinjar and Kirkuk, they they went down to to uh, to the same camp, to our to Mahmoud camp, to protect the camp in the same way that happened in 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 Sinjar. In this in in that time, a number of civilians lost their lives in the in these terrorist attacks of ISIS. To this day, they are still targeted by ISIS. Bi destpîkirina êrişên Daişê re hemwat dewleta Tirk jî êrişên xwe pêk anî. Ji sala 2017an ve bi giştî şeş caran xampa me dibe armanca balafirên şer û balafirên bêmirov. Heya niha yazdeh malatiyên me jiyana xwe ji dest dane û hejmarek jî birîndar bûne. Zerarekî pir mezin gêşke baxçe û cihêla urbaniya gel jî. Turkey has started to attack since the beginning of the uh, Islamic State attacks a total of six times since 2017. Our camp has been the target of uh, airplanes and drones. So far, 11 of our uh, compatriots have lost their lives and a number of them have been injured. Great damage was done to the agricultural land and animal husbandry. <laughs> Ji hevdeyê ma hev ve di hezar û nozdehan ve pedeke bi navê hikûmeta herêmî li ser daxwaza dewleta Tirk anbar bû dorpêçek tund li ser xampa me pêk tîne. Di encama vê dorpêcê de gelek karesetên mirovî çî bûne. Ji ber rê nehat dayîna nexweşan bi qasî şeş dayîkên di canê darûkê xwe ji dest dane. Cardin bi qasî sad û pêncî xwendevanan li hevliyê rîyên dixwînin ji ber rêgirî û aslangî û zextên pedekê ji xwendina xwe bûne zêdeyî du hezar karker ji karê xwe bûne ev jî bûye sedema rewşekê pir xirab aliyê aborî de çê bibit ji ber debara gel piranî ser karkertiyê ye nikarin pêwîstiyên xwe yên wekî xwarin ve xwarin û derman pêşwazî bikin ji xwe ji du hezar û şazdehan ve netewî yek bûyî û dewleta Iraqê jî bi biryarekî di hezar û hejdehan ez raqê me xut kiriye ji ber wê gel daliyê aborî de astengiyê mezin jiyan dikitin di vê rewşê re bahadirina rewşa koronayê re jî rewş dikarim bêjim girantir bûye Since 2019 the PDK party which is known as the KRG a severe ban and siege was implied on, on our camp and the request and pressure of Turkey, which, le which led to signs of human tragedies as six pregnant mothers lost their babies because they were prevented from reaching the hospitals. As many as 150 university students left the university in Erbil due to obstacles and pressures from the uh, Kurdistan region government. More than 2,000 workers lost their jobs, which, which led to, to the, the deterioration of the uh, economic situation. People cannot meet their basic needs, such as food, drink, and medicine, because the economy depends on, on workers. Since 2016, the United Nations has, hasn't provided any assistance to us. And also Iraq has cut off their humanitarian aid in, in 2018. This is why people face a huge obstacle in the economic aspect of life. With this serious condition, the coronavirus has made life even more difficult. Her çıkaz netemi yegüyü dihenek aliyan da arikari kiribajî, 
لیل گوری زاگون خواه یک پنابران او سال 1951 پر اشکره که تو ارکو برپرسیارتی خواه بنابرای ما پیک ناینه جده ماده این سرکه ای پیمانه و اگر مرو تماشا بکه ای وک ماف جانی ای آزادی ای فکر سیاسی ای پاراستنی ای تندرستی ای پرورده ماف جن و زاروکان ای کسی تمندار دو روز ایرو ده جوانه یک تن اجیل برانبری ما اف مافانه بیک نایی دکارم بیجم بی مافی و بی حقوقی ها هری مزن که ایرو نمینه و دی جهانی ده تو نیه ده برانبری ما تی پیکانی اصلا ده افجی تی واتای بم پیکر نا زاگون آخوا بخواجی Although the United Nations has helped in some aspects before but according to the 1951 Refugee Act it's very clear that it does not fulfill any of its duties and responsibilities towards us, such as the first 10 articles of the Act, the right of life, liberty, political thoughts, protection, health, education, children, women, etc. The greatest injustice and unfairness ever is being perpetuated against us. This means violating their own law itself. دولت عراقی جی پیمان پنابران امضا کریه دنما خود پیمان پنابر این سیاسی جیه یا سال 1971 رقم پنجیه و کسطاتوی پنابر این سیاسی ما قبول جی کریه لگوری وی پیمان ناسنامه و ناسنامه جی دائمه لی دبن اولکاری وانده روژنه راست ایرشین تینه چار سال بی نابر بالاخرین شهر و بالافرین بیم رو این دولت ترک لسر آسمان اراقی دبن کنترول آماریقایی ده گل میسوی بمباباران دیگنه اف دبه سدم اکو دالی درونی ده باندور اگه پر خراب لسر زاروکان، لسر جنان، لسر جواکی بکتن یعنی نه دیاره کی جان دمه کی جان سعیده دی کو داری وی خلک سویل وره بمباباران کرن اف کی جان که پر مزنه دولت اتور دیگتن لی مخابن همو عالی همو هیز برانبری بی بیدنگن و حتی آستکی هفکاری آوی دیگنن The Iraqi government has signed refugee agreement in 1971 uh, number 51 We have been officially accepted then as a political refugees in accordance with, the, with this agreement and on this basis we have been given identification identities but under their protection and under American control, we have been attacked on a daily basis for four years by Turkish drones, targeting civilians in the camp. Psychologically, it has a very bad effect and impact on children and women and everyone in the society, as it's not known when and where it will be, it, it will be attacked and it will bomb these civilians. This is a war crime by Turkey. But all sides are silent and are cooperating at some level against us. Jibouwe, am bang jibou hamou mrobin wadi wujdan dikin, hamou aliyin peyvendar dikin. Am penaberin siyasi ne, statuyo mev siyasi haye. Yani am tishteki kupir zeyde am tukhazim tu neye. Am tani da khazam maafin khadik. Yani aliyin berpirs erku berpirsiyarti yifal beramberi me. So, in conclusion, I would like to say an appeal to the uh, consciousness was people and all relevant parties. We just want our rights. We don't know. We don't uh, need anything else. We just need our rights. So, the United Nations, according to their political situation, should do their duty towards our camp. بانک <تصفيق> بدمی داویا ایرشا چی بویی لیدا توماس جبو ایرشن پنج حزیرانی بسیار مچی بو ام گرین دی بینی لی دوی بردوامی آخفتن آخوا پراتیکی 
ایوا ایرشا لسر قامپامه را هستی دن یعنی او ایرشانه ایدی بداوی ببین جاردن آسمان قامپامه دبن اولکاری نتوین یک بوی به طایبت دبن اولکاری دولت آماریقا و دولت اراقی ده یعنی او دوی آسمان قامپی وک رزداران جو پیشنیار که دوی آسمان قام که باشور گشتی جه بارا فری را گشتی و را پیکانی هر ایمه که شفرینی را قدخه و را این هم گیره And also the state of Iraq should fulfill its responsibilities under the 1971 convention We consider Linda Thomas plea about the June 5th attacks on us very important and appreciated, but we must continue to try to prevent these attacks in practice. Also, the air zone over the camp is under the uh, United States and Iraqi control. So the air zone above the camp and all the, the uh, Kurdistan region government should be closed to, to all the aircraft. <laughs> دادگاه مافی مروان دیوان عدالت اروپا کمیسیون حقوقی این نام نتوی دیگه لبرانبری اف سوژن توان اردوغان ای دولت تصور لبرانبری گلیمه قامپی ملت دیمه پیک دیدن دوی 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 on the International Court of Justice, the International Criminal Court, the Court of Human Rights, the European Court of Justice, and the International Law Commission to sue Erdogan because of all these crimes that, uh, that he committed against our people in the camp and in general the Kurdish people. As Khazan Veji Vejim, Yani Armanja Erdogan, Rizdaram Pranizman, Armanja Erdogan. یعنی اوه ایره شهری داوی لسر ما یاکشی بو بینجی حضیرانی جی پیام اگه از تبل دبه ما یعنی پیام اگه دبه لبه قامپی مروف به چاند خواه به زمان خواه پرورده دبه نه ایره شهر چی بو جی لسر دبستان چی بو ایره شهر چی بو جی لحریم این کو زاروت لی دخوینن چی بو یعنی از تبل پیام اگه جبو جبو ما دبه جتن رخم این کو بیستو حق سالا تو قنابر بوی جی So I would like to say as well uh, the, that the attacks that happened uh, at, at the, the last uh, weeks is it's a ma message for us that even though that you have been fleed for, for 20, more than 20 years, you cannot live with your own uh, culture. You could not live uh, by your, your, your by your nation, because it's uh, it's something dangerous for Turkey, as our colleagues mentioned. So again, at the end, I would like to thank you all for listening. I hope that this meeting can be uh, one of the reasons that uh, will stop and, and, and make Erdogan uh, take back seat and, and stop all the attacks against the uh, Mahmoud camp and all the Kurdish people. This was uh, my statement. I, will, I would like to go to Megan. Thank you so much. Sorry. Thank you so much for your participation in this conference. I think that hearing this testimony from the people who've been impacted by these policies was very powerful. And I think I would like to thank everyone for watching even if you only came to this panel to listen to that alone. And I wanna say that what we've just heard 
is a problem for all of us. It's an issue that every person concerned with human rights and freedom and justice should be concerned with. Because with what Turkey has been doing and the situation that they've subjected these people to has gone on with international support since the very beginning. And one very concerning thing that we're seeing is that while the people of the United States and Europe and the rest of the world understand completely, you know, that this is a situation of injustice, our governments are carrying out very repressive policies and supporting Turkey and its allies who are trying to threaten the people of Mahmur, the people of South Kurdistan, of all of Iraq, all of Syria, North and East Syria in particular. And on that note, um, we have a guest here with us today, a member of the international peace delegation that recently tried to go to Hawler, to Erbil, and was denied entry by KRG security forces because they came with the goal of diffusing tensions and sharing information about the situation with the media. Özlem Yenyay, who I believe is here, um, if you'd like to give a bit of a comment about the situation with the delegation and how I believe the German government, uh, the government of the KRG and other states have tried to stop peace activists from going to pay attention to this international war on Kurdistan. Uh, we'd love to hear your perspective and to raise awareness of these attacks on, um, you know, rights activists and um, efforts to make peace. Thank you, Oslem. Um, you're welcome. Um, sorry, because I was not ready. I just wanted to attend as a listener. Oh. But okay, I can uh, make a... The... Yeah, feel yeah, for sure. I'm... I just the uh, the the commission uh, mentioned that you might want to speak. If you wouldn't, that's totally fine, yeah. but we just... I can definitely, you know, I can try to give some, make a summary uh, about the current situation, what we have been living, you know, yes. like I arrived with a part of the delegation on the 8th of June, and we, we make it safe and sound to Erbil, and then the next day we were going to have um, a meeting with the par some parliamentarians, but uh, we couldn't achieve that because we are kind of blocked. Uh, to go uh, and I mean they uh, cancelled the um, postponed kind of the uh, meetings with us and then we have told that like we, we will be um, they will be they were going to visit us in the uh, hotel where we were staying so they didn't appear and the next day uh, we had some we are here now uh, 70 people and then more people were going to attend, actually participate us. But uh, then after 8 and 9th of June, we started to hear about these uh, deportations, you know, first problems, and then some deportations um, at the airport of, from the airport of Erbil. Uh, um, but two days ago, yes, we th then we heard that it started from the origin of con countries where people come. And uh, for now, I, I mean, yeah, in terms of all the um, all the attempts that they have been trying to prevent us to do something, uh, glad that we are really believed and. Um, courage we have uh, journalists like media uh, comrades internationalists like from different media collectives from all or, all over the europe so they have been doing this you know press releases videos and a lot of media works uh, since three four days and hopefully this evening um the finally uh, the um, foreign minister of the uh, KDP uh, visited us um, finally, and then. But I have I'm, I am not uh, at the hotel right now, so I don't know the results of the meeting. Um, yeah, for now, yeah. I what I can tell you is that uh, I cannot give more information, unfortunately, because I am not, you know, the person. I didn't ask. Uh, to anyone if i could speak even so this is a bit <laughs> yeah surprising but i'm I think sorry for me and uh, for the yeah, delegation as well um 
Yeah. Thank you. Um, and I, there might have been a bit of a miscommunication on our side there, for which I completely apologize. But I do want to thank you for stepping up and sharing anyway, because the mission of this delegation is something so important um, for you know so many people. And I think that as we look at how to move forward, now is really the time for everybody to be taking action to support peace, human rights, and democracy whether that's calling on our governments to shift policies, whether that's um, showing our solidarity for people on the ground. There's a lot of ways in which people can take action. And so while I apologize for the very last minute question and for our uh, misunderstanding there, I want to thank you so much for speaking so eloquently about what you're doing. And I hope that people watching this will look into the situation of these international peace delegations and the, you know, frankly, authoritarian treatment with which they've been met. So I appreciate that. And on that note, I would like to open it up for questions from our audience. You can send them in the chat um, to me or to the chat in general. Um, and if you have a panelist that you want to direct them to, you can mention that. And so we'll be taking for the remainder of this meeting our question and answer section. I believe um, Hamo Muskofian has his hand raised. Do you have a question? You're muted, sorry. Uh, all the discussions that were going on there and uh, the places that they had mentioned I've been there a dozen times. I'm not talking from Beirut. Uh, in complete the darkness also here. So uh, uh, um, about Turkey, uh, it's, it's, it's not surprised what they are doing, but the most surprising is that only talking and talking and condemning Turkey, Turkey do not understand only military power. If all these huge forces and powers are going through something, they must use military power as, as a as I concluded, because Erdogan had come out of the uh, battle and uh, he thinks that he is the leader of the Islamic fundamentalist world, uh, world especially uh, the, the Turkish world, and he is also the, uh, the emperor, so he is not listening to anybody. So uh, for me as a journalist and who had seen more than eight wars and recently also the explosion of Peru that happened, so uh, as I see that the only way of stopping uh, uh, Erdogan is using political power. So this is my comment. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, and I would like to recommend to the speakers here that uh, we would prefer questions, uh, though if you do have some context for your question, that is accepted. So um, I appreciate the comment. If anyone has questions for the panelists, we'd be happy to take them now. I'll go ahead and just uh, um, answer or just add to his thought. While I understand Turkey only understands, it seems the military power, of course, is the most powerful way um, <laughs> for, for Erdogan to be moved. You know, I, I believe there are lots of options from an economic standpoint. I think the U.S. could dump their lira, could do all sorts of things, could threaten all sorts of things that could have a huge economic impact on the country that could be very powerful as well. And unfortunately, I think um, military action is off the table for the U.S., but there are plenty of actions I believe the U.S. could do and could privately threaten that could um, impact Erdogan's decisions. Thank you for the comment. That is um, important to note. And that's exactly, you know, when I think when I talk about what normal people can do, um, putting pressure on your governments, whether that's protesting or writing to your elected officials or, you know, hosting discussions like this, um, you know, I genuinely think that the people of the United States and the people of Europe unequivocally um, do not support what Turkey is doing. And I think that they don't support, you know, the times when our governments are allowing Turkey to get away with this and supporting Turkey's actions. So I think that really putting up the pressure for all of the, you know, choosing a path of diplomacy, you know, an end to support for some of these military interventions and backing of these armed groups, there's a lot of ways that pressure can be put on and looking into what can be done, you know, that's something for people to demand. So 
that makes a lot of sense. Uh, I appreciate your comment. Any questions from the audience for any of our panelists? Um, okay, I think that, um, you know, if people want to take time to think of something, we completely understand, you know, I will stress that we have the opportunity here for, you know, journalists or academics or anyone in the audience, you know, to speak directly to people in Lachmore. Um, so it would be a good chance to ask your questions. I guess I could start um, and pass something around to the panelists, anyone who wants to answer. Um, I think that with the Biden Erdogan meeting tomorrow, um, as we've talked about, oh, it looks like we do have a question. So that's great. And I don't have to think of one on the spot right here. Uh, Sarah Glynn has her hand up. I'm gonna unmute you and Sarah, you can ask your question. Hello. Um, yes, I was wondering if Boa could um, give us more detail about the excuses that have been given by the UN and by the Iraqi government for withdrawing support for Mahmoud Camp. And also perhaps a little bit more detail about how the boycott by the KDP on the camp works, what it actually means on the ground for the people in the camp. Sorry, I've not got a very good connection. Did you get me? Um, I did. Um, I'm not sure if they did. I've written the I've written the question as well in the chat actually. Yes. Sorry, uh, just give me a minute so I can translate the question. Oh, perfect. Got yeah. it. Great. It's in the chat. I've written it in the chat in the to the EU TCC. Okay. Okay. No problem. Uh, now, یعنی هنگ رایداری آن دویژن هم و کلی دویژن زختن دولت دو تور زختن پدکی هنگ بوی هم نکاری ورن و هنگ جی پیوژه دایشی یه جدا اول کاری آخه گوتنم نکاری ورن آری کاریان نکاری پیش بینی so we have uh, for the UN, and, and they're not uh, that um, not supporting the, the camp. We have tried to understand their their their, their perspectives, uh, the, the, why they are not uh, providing any help. But they were always telling us. Uh, we were asking them, why aren't you coming to your offices? Why aren't you uh, helping us? They were always telling us, um, like. I lame excuses. Some of their seniors have told us that this is because of Turkish and the Keda Bay pressure. They are not allowing us to help. They are trying to, you know, put some pressure on us. Uh, some of them are trying to say because of the security issues after the ISIS attack, it's all related to security. <laughs> محمجی و کریم یک بناکو که ماده سادو چله دی بیش بر اداره نزلانش بوی از نکارم وانه هیجت ایک بیوی آوایی دی دی پیش لی بی گمانه هیجت بی بنگه هست کارم نمینه بدم یعنی دروشا کورونه ایده 
او که پیوستی ما همون جاری که تنیجی آریکاریج و کمپینه کرد یعنی مجاره کرونه ای ده و So for the uh, security uh, excuse that they are telling us is they are telling us because Mahmur camp is within the uh, 140 uh, unstable region, uh, you know, according to the Iraqi law 140 act, which is uh, the, uh, so the administration is not, uh, you know, uh, uh, it's not, you know, they don't know who the admi administ administrative is, so it's not related to K KRG or the Iraqi government, so it's not definitive. Uh, as, uh, as he said, for example, in the, in the coronavirus pandemic, they haven't provided any of the, uh, the, the assistance that we needed. Uh, during this uh, pandemic, although that the, the area needs uh, an urgent and, and, and very big uh, amount of, of, of uh, assistance. Yani Natani Guil Hambari Hamu Ben Pikirin, the Sermati Pikonim Bidengi, Yani Yak Ambition of Kosi Chen Irish, the Serpon Pishibun, the Hazor Hadiva, I don't know Yani Dokuyani Neda, the Serpon. یعنی اگر بالا واجی کشا با تنی داخویه نیک تنی جی نده یعنی داخویه نیک ایوسا جبون جبون روشا قامپی نده لگوری لگوری من ارجی نزیکاتی اگه سیاسیه لگوری برجاندی سیاست دا دولت دا ترک یا حریم تردیه and uh, regarding the, the, the attacks the UN hasn't uh, uh, hasn't spoken in any statement. It's, it hasn't always uh, silence about the, the attacks that happened uh, against the camp. So I think it's just a political issue. It's all related to political uh, situations, uh, you know, uh, under the pressure of Turkey and the uh, Kurdistan region. <laughs> مثل داخل دولت دا ترک و آنبارگوی پیکتی نکن جبر چه و ایرش لسر باشور کرسان چی بون هما پشتی وی دو روزان دولت دا ترک ایرش پیگانی پده کشی آنبار بودن پده که لسر اساس داخل دولت دا ترک آنبار بودانیه چه و دولت دا ترک کنسپت دا ایرش لسر باشور so regarding the the uh, the embargo that the uh, the PDK party the Kurdistan region government have uh, put on the uh, the uh, Mahmur camp that's also uh, because of the Turkish uh, you know uh, required that Turkish tell, told them to uh, because you know, after the attack that Turkey has uh, started in the in the in the Kurdistan region, they just uh, started the embargo. So it's just like uh, it happened in, in a parallel uh, time. Yani Armanj, Armanj, our camp of Mahmur, the Irishi Aburi, the Jawaki, this are Irishi in Hawaii psychology. The way I mention camp of Mahmur, but Armanj. So uh, the goal of all these attacks and the embargo is to destroy the the uh, Mahmur uh, community. The, 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 to uh, to can destroy them in the in their political, economical, psychological aspect, and 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 destroy all the the. The, the uh, governance that they have uh, established in, in, in this time. So, uh, as I can say, the Padake is the right hand for the uh, Turkish attacks on the area. And then, we That's all, if, if, if you can. If, if that's okay, uh, if you can have any, uh, if you have any comments on that.
Thank you uh, very much. Um, very informative answer. Gelix vas versivate perbashbu. Uh, so one topic that I'd like to bring up and uh, open up to the panel is that as we're speaking right now, the Twitter account of the Mahmoor camp, uh, which is active on Twitter and has a few thousand followers, has been restricted, um, preventing their tweets from being seen by much of their audience. They've just posted about this. Um, and this is, as I'm sure many people in here know, you know, not an uncommon problem for critics of Turkish policy. So I'd like to open that up to the panel. Um, why do we think this happens? Uh, why do we think that, you know, this is such a common problem online? And uh, maybe Nadine, you want to start with that? And our other panelists can say a word too about this online censorship issue? Yeah, this is very disturbing the day that, that um, Turkey has a second strike on, on this refugee camp, the day we're having this conversation. Literally, um, Twitter comes back and tells them that we've temporarily limited some of your account features. Um, and so what I'd recommend when we talk about ways we can help, I think it's, it's what I have found in the work I've done is so many people, whether it be neighbors, um, but even people on Capitol Hill, members of Congress are unaware of what's happening. And so I think the, this community has been really powerful at telling stories. So those of you watching, listening, you know, tell the story of what you're hearing. Tell the story of what's happening in this Mahmoud refugee camp. I recommend that you go to Twitter if you're on Twitter and follow them. The Mahmoud camp is, is the name of it. Um, and so that they'll have a broader reach. I think we all need to also reach out to Twitter and I'll be doing that um, and tweeting to Twitter to not be a pawn of the Turkish government because that's obviously what's happening right now. But I think this is, like you said, a piece of a bigger problem, which is limiting people's voices. And that's where all of you come in. You, you can, um, you know, um, magnify these voices and make sure that the things that are being said, uh, the victims of these camps, people that are just wanting to um, access their human rights that every person on this earth has right to, according to the um, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, that we can stand up for those that have no voice because we do have this opportunity to speak up. So I really encourage ever, everyone to take that opportunity, even right now, to stand with Mahmoud Camp on Twitter and make sure that they're allowed to continue to act, to, to tell their story. Thank you. Um, I wholeheartedly endorse that message, um, you know, letting people get the word out. And that's great. Um, and I'm sure many people here have had similar experiences with online censorship. Um, and then on the other side of Twitter's policies, they allow Turkish diplomats who deny the Armenian genocide and justify war crimes and threaten their enemies with violence to use their accounts freely. So it's a real problem. I shared the link to the Twitter in the chat would love everyone to follow, amplify, and tell these stories. Um, I see we've got another question from uh, Ms. Westheim to uh, Bawar Unver in Makmur. Um, feel free to ask. Panelists yeah. can ask questions too, so. Uh, yeah, I hope uh, the panelists can ask questions too. So I have uh, just one question for you, Bewa. It was very interesting listening to you. And uh, you should have had more time, but we have only the two hours. Um, what is, in what, uh, in your opinion, what do you think uh, will happen next? Turkey is uh, now very aggressive and and uh, has already attacked. Do you think this will continue, or is it some kind of threat? Or w w what would you say? What would you say about the future, the next weeks, for example? Very rusty, rusty. Irishian now children, for Judan, Irishian for Qatar, no can. Yani. Even if you have a child, you can't get a child. 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 You can these attacks are Erdogan that are happening right now. It's all over the area. It's not just uh, the Mahmoud camp. So the 
their goal is, their objective that Erdogan has put in his mind is to kill all the Kurds, not just the people of, of the, the, the Mahmoud camp, all the Kurds that have some freedom, have the, 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 uh, the ability to live on their, their culture. يعني هو يرشين إن هذا صار مقموري يشيد بن أم نكارين جيرشين بسر وجوي كردستان يشيد بن قد بيجرين دس أم نكارين يرشين بسر باشور يرو يشيد بن قد بيجرين دس يعني همو بها بجري داية إيش بوي يعني براستي أجر هل وستك خورت أم بيجين تكوشينك خورت لبرامبري فاشيزم أردوغان فاشيزم دولة تورك يعني جات ترس <laughs> so we cannot unrelate the attacks on uh, Al Mahmoud camp uh, from the, the the one that happens on the in uh, in Rojava in the northeast of Syria and the other in the other area. So it's all related to each other. It's happening because of one reason. So if there's no position of there's no strong uh, statement. There's no uh, strong positions against these attacks. It will continue. Yani, devlet of Turk regime Erdogan, Jbor Rawati be the Ereshifa, Harush Dert Kavichid, be the Kampa Mahmoud, Nizam Chakodishine, Turkey, Nizam Sharvana de Shinitin, Yani Avid Bicha, Kali, the Vijetin, Jber, and the Bin. سينوري دولة عراقي دنا سيوانا نتوي يكبيها يعني أب أب نم ممكنه شو هذا بدن أم بصدان نقطين كنترولها أب نم ممكنه تشكي أب أو كي بيبنجها جبوي دبن دبن نافي شري ناف نينو كده شري دجي تروري ريش حمو كرده آزاد بيجتن so for the uh, the attacks that uh, are happening on from the Turkish government uh, every day the Turkish uh, president uh, and the Turkish government are saying on the media on their propaganda that the Mahmoud camp is sending weapons to Turkey. I mean, within Turkey, to help the, the, the Kurdish other militias. And they're sending also fighters to fight against Turkey. How can, like, he's, he's saying, how can you imagine something like that? This is very, uh, this is preposterous. This is cannot happen because we are under the the Iraqi uh, government. Uh, there's a lot of Iraqi checkpoints. That there's a lot of uh, Iraqi guards that we cannot uh, do such a thing. So this is very uh, propaganda. This is a very bad uh, propaganda against us. يعني دبن نوفي نوفا نينو كده دبن نوفي يرشين دي تروريزم ده لهر داري يرشي كردي آزاد آزاد بيجت إنها دبين دولتين يجبون أمريكا جي أوروبا جي جبر حركات آزادية كرد خصنا بيست تروري ده أب رواتية بيرشيون ده ده بيجاني أنجو لكو داري لأوروبا جي صبا إن اللي قام في مغمود the garden bomba baram big yanji wek buyara paris if it's a cutter big kitten bejit digi terror shark yani ev bukham matter seki from azana yani we dame a kurdi kud hazard the rumad jion big herd hertum jion away the matter seed so under the name of fighting terrorism uh, the turkish government is doing genocides against the Kurdish people just under the name of fighting terrorism. And because of uh, that, all the uh, European governments and the United States uh, government have put uh, the PKK in, on their uh, terrorist list, uh, Erdogan is using that, is taking, uh, taking advantage of that. So he's fighting all the Kurdish people in that name that he's fighting PKK. So for example, maybe 
uh, tomorrow in, in, in Europe, it will happen uh, the same. So he, he will kill somebody, he will bomb some there, some uh, areas under the name of, of uh, killing or fighting the PKK. As it happened in, in, in Paris, he killed three women under the name of fighting the PKK. <laughs> یعنی از فکر کاری که دستوی گم بکین دویم دی لیستای تروری برطرف بکین جوالی رای کن یان وقت بیتری وی هر تم ایرش بسر مهمه ای ام جی دعوی ما فقا دیکین ای روا دیکین او چلو چار ساله او ما فی هر یه خواستن جو سه ساله زدتری جو شرکی در کردستانی هایی او هر کس بزن سن سو وی شد you know, um, divide these two uh, issues, the PKK and the, the, the civilians that are getting attacks from Turkey. So, because otherwise, these attacks will continue and they will not stop because they're always uh, using the same name and the same excuse. Uh, this, this, uh, this fight between the PKK and the Turkish government have been, uh, has been happening uh, since like, 40 years, so it's not something uh, new, but right now he's, he's fighting all the Kurdish people in, in, in the same area. Jibuyi Mahmurji parçaya ki, yani Mahmur bu kadar kampa Mahmur bu kadar ancama ki politika karkirina devleta Türkiye. Yani eğer yani tekuşina ki kurt ya hezin demokrasiye, the Beranber Ebi Pignet, Avi Rishiko Berdam, Yani Bidakuyanian, the Ambition Brea, Henek Halwestin, who saw Nerm, Beguman, Vipi Vajri, and Nukarin, Fisha, Rishin Devlato, Pikirin, Minakoyari Berbachov, Iroji, Rishaki, Mr. Harki Civil Pig. And the, the, uh, the Mahmoud camp is one of the results of this policy that he is finding all the Kurdish. They were they were uh, civilians living in villages, but they had to flee because of this policy. We weren't uh, armed, we weren't having any any uh, weapons, but we had to leave because uh, we were Kurds. So if there, as I said before, if there's no uh, strong position, if there's no if there's no pressure on Turkey, these attacks will continue because he just uh, know how to to fight. He doesn't know anything else. And the Baku Dreji, who developed a Turk, Yani, Ya Zinieta, Fascist, Ya Turani, Armand Yani, and Agar the Kurdistan of Chinder, Jam, is everything you know, Zinieta, the Sarasas, Dogger Kerini, Master Hero, Libya, Dogger, the Chilibe, the Chusuri, Euro, Irish Arab, Yani, Asta. دولت ترک به ذهنیات عثمانی جبو حمو مروهای تحلیکلیه خطره یک پر مازن اجبر ذهنیت که رادیقال یا یا اخوانی مسلمی هم یا اسلامی هم یعنی اگر پیشیلی نهی گردن اجبو جهانی حمو خطره یک پر مازن هم So, uh, I'm sorry for being uh, for this uh, prolonged answer, but this uh, fascist mindset of Erdogan is something he, he wants to occupy Everywhere he can go, if if there's no if there's no uh, there's no one telling him to stop, uh, he went to he 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 invaded Libya, Azerbaijan, and other places. So uh, if, if Syria and and and, and other places. Uh, yeah. So this uh, he is uh, he's uh, considering himself the caliphate of the uh, Ottoman uh, Empire. So. As I said, if there's no strong uh, statement, if there's no pressure on him, no, he will not stop. That was all. Sorry for the problem. Thank you, Deva. Thank you, um, and thank you for the question and for that very important answer. Um, we are running up on time, so looking at the questions that we have, one from uh, Sarah Glynn, um, and these two questions here seem very related, so I'm going to do my best to put them together. What do the panelists think could be the impact of the, the deportations of peace activists and journalists from Hauler? 
and how can we use this to raise greater awareness of what's happening. And then another from Mahmoud Patel, who mentions Turkey's decades of human rights violations and genocidal contact against the Kurds in particular within its borders and outside. Trade volume between the USA and Turkey is over $20 billion in addition to other NATO members and asking about um, tactics like boycott, divestment, and sanctions against Turkish goods and Turkish economic targets, together with diplomatic and political pressure linked to the release of Abdullah Öcalan and the delisting of the PKK. So about you know, international actions, whether these peace delegations or um, taking economic and you know, political action against Turkey in our home countries, what can we do? Um, and I think I'll give that to um, carry on if you'd like to talk, because I know in Europe there's active solidarity campaigns, campaigns against arms sales to Turkey. Um, there's a boycott Turkey campaign in the UK that I believe is doing well. So what should be done? What can be done? Um, maybe if you want to talk about those solidarity efforts. As we start with uh, the peace delegation, because I have been, uh, I have been, uh, I have experienced the same. When uh, going, I was going to a, a women's conference in Ahmed, invited, and was stopped and, and uh, in Istanbul and sent back. So this is what happened, and, and dozens of people have experienced this. But of course, it's important that these people who are are being stopped. Uh, uh, at the border or at the airport, that they that 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 they go to the press and and have make some fuss about it, because it's important and and uh, it's important for other people to understand what is happening, and of course this will no this is a situation now where a lot of delegations go to South Korea to Erbil, uh, given the situation. And uh, okay, this is not, it's not, uh, it's not a good experience to be stopped at the border or wherever, but it's also an opportunity to tell the world what is happening. Uh, about the, the, the other boycotts, I think someone else maybe could uh, answer that question better than me. Perhaps Michael Gunther, are you there? Perhaps he could... Uh, have an answer to that. Yeah, that would be um, anyone who wants to talk about um, those campaigns, about what we can concretely do about, you know, arms sales to Turkey, security assistance to Turkey, uh, Turkish goods, because I know that that's something that, you know, you see Kurds talking about this, you see Armenians talking about this, you see a lot of communities really working to um, put that economic pressure there. Um, I think more so in Europe than the US because it's my understanding that on the side of uh, goods and travel, um, you have that more in Europe. But in the US, um, you know, the US is the primary um, provider of arms and security assistance to Turkey. I think we've seen a good step in that the United States will now no longer be providing F-35 aircrafts to Turkey. Obviously, they didn't do that because those jets are used against civilians as American F-16s have been. But it sets a good precedent that I think, you know, especially if we build a movement calling for an end to those arms sales, you know, it's quite simple. The American people don't want to be complicit in the bombing of Kurdish and Yazidi and Assyrian and Armenian villages. The American people don't want to be giving weapons to armed forces that are, you know, raiding people's homes, that are torturing civilians, that are assaulting women. I think that's all very morally clear cut. Um, and I think that I would really like to see more organizing around those issues. I definitely agree it's very important. And I think that, you know, that would be the subject of a whole other panel if we were going to talk about the very necessary solidarity yeah. options. I think so too. All right. Um, and on that note, it is 1.58 p.m. Um, I think I see one hand raised. So if we can get this question and the answer very quickly, I'll take this one last question and then we'll be out. So uh, Fazal Kurdi, you're up. Are you muted? You're muted. Yes, there we go. Okay, um, uh, hi, hello, hello everyone. Um, as a former UN staff member, um, I worked as a peacekeeper 
uh, all over the place in Bosnia and Afghanistan. And I had the privilege to work with the, with the, um, uh, for the camp in, in Northern Iraq, in KRG, while these refugees, they were settled in Atush uh, camp. Um, um, I have a, a, a comment uh, about uh, how come the UN is able to abandon a camp in uh, with the 12,000 people in Mahmoud without any official document. Uh, my question for, for this, for, 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 the, for the representative, did you have a, any attempt to meet in person? Uh, they might have a excuse that because of the, because of the ISIS or any other excuses that can, they can't come to the, the camp. Did you have a chance to meet them in person? If so, how many uh, did you? Uh, if so, do you have any document? Because UN has has to document any camp or closure of any camp to give you or to 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 give to give out an official document that this camp is closed. Do you have any any document from the UNHCR in Erbil about closure of camp? If, 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 if you have, um, we need that one. If not, we might do uh, the other way around. As, as, a, as, as, as US citizen over here, we have a right to write to our representative in the UN, US UN representative to, to go and look at, at this issue seriously. So uh, please answer my question. Thank you very much. Okay, um, it looks like the connection that we have with Mahmoud has been interrupted. Um, this is an issue that we have when we're talking to people in Syria and Iraq, so I'm very sorry about that. Um, I think we're going to try to wrap this up very quickly. Um, as we mentioned, you know, we have an opportunity for people to stay in contact with people in Mahmoud. Um, you can contact us, the organizers, about that. But I'd like to give, um, hold on. I'd like to give uh, Michael Gunter, who's here, um, who's affiliated with the EU TCC, um, an opportunity to speak a bit about the situation. He's been here and he's been very patient um, and he's an expert on these issues. So over to you, Michael, if you want to make a few short remarks. Not at all. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, have listened to so many educated people. There's so much I would like to say, just very briefly. I'm reading right now a book uh, by uh, a prominent Turkish scholar, Hakan Yavuz. It's a biography of Erdogan. And I strongly recommend it to all of us because uh, when we seek to correct these problems that we have been talking about, uh, it is valuable to know how the other side thinks and uh, what is in back of Erdogan. In addition, uh, in this uh, book, there's an entire chapter on the Kurds and some very enlightening information about the situation. And I must say, overall, this book is extremely critical of Erdogan. And another book I've been reading recently by Genghis Jandar, uh, Turkey's Mission Impossible. And some of you are very familiar with Genghis Jandar and his uh, long-term relationship to these questions and a, a, a very valuable discussion of the Kurdish situation in Jander's book. Uh, very quickly, one more comment. Uh, my understanding about the US uh, not sending F-35 jets to Turkey is it's not a boycott of Turkey, it's because of Turkey's acceptance of the S-400 uh, Russian uh, air defense system. 
which uh, U.S. sees as compromising the NATO defense system. And that is why uh, Erdogan's uh, acceptance of the Soviet air defense system uh, is why the U.S. has uh, cut off delivery of F-35 jets, uh, not, not because these jets were used uh, against the Kurds, although I'm sure that's in back of uh, the mind of the new president. Uh, as you all know, President Joe Biden has a long history uh, being interested in the Kurdish situation, uh, unlike uh, his predecessor, uh, President Trump. And so I think that uh, we are going to see some more positive for the Kurds uh, accomplishments on the part of the new American president. Uh, and uh, they will be based on intelligence and great experience instead of just lashing out at, at the wind. Uh, I wish I, I could say more, but thank you for the brief uh, time here. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Um, and I do, I would recommend the uh, Genghis Chandar book. Um, he's someone, you know, having worked on these attempted peace processes throughout uh, the decades that they've been going on. It's a valuable perspective. Um, so thank you for the reading recommendation and for your comments today. Um, I believe we're still having an issue reaching Mahmoor. Are they there? They do not appear to be here. Uh, so I think with that, we've already gone five minutes over our time. I want to just close by thanking everyone for being here today and listening to this very important conversation. And I wanna say, look, now is not the time to do nothing. We're at a moment right now looking at what we've just learned and discussed today with these very important voices about the very destabilizing role that Turkey is playing in the region and the way in which governments have supported and enabled those destabilizing policies. And it's really up to us to push for something different and to foreground peace, democracy, human rights, of all the people who live in the region. And I believe that conversations like this and the actions we'll take going forward in our respective countries. Um, and again, I do wanna say a very diverse international audience here today. So I always love to see that as well, but this is the great starting point. And thank you everyone for being here. If you have any questions, um, I'll send my email to the chat. Um, and people have contact with the EU TCC page. People know how to contact each other. So that's great. Let's stay in touch, keep having these conversations and I hope everyone has a great day.